Hello, my name is John Stokes. I'm here at my home in uh, Corrales, New Mexico. A bitter cold night, and a friend of mine from Iceland is here to help me film my contribution to a project that I was asked to join that they call Nanao at 100. I was delighted to be included in this, I got an email from Gary Lawless. Would I like to tell some stories from Australia? Because 40 some years ago, I traveled to Australia with Gary Snyder and with Nanao. And we spent six weeks on a tour that I set up uh, through urban and outback communities of Aboriginal people. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy some of the stories that had to do with that tour, how it came to be, and all the wonderful poetry and writing that came about. I was in Australia as a young guy in my 20s, and I was working as a, a, a music teacher, teaching guitar at a college for adult Aborigines. And one night, I had a dream. And in that dream, I was walking around Uluru, that big, beautiful red rock in the center of Australia. And I was walking with Gary Snyder, and there was a third person there, but I could not see his face. And when I woke up, I said to my, my partner at the time, uh, an Australian woman named Gillian, I told her the dream, and she said to me, that's a beautiful dream, you should make it come true. And I thought, what a good idea. I had met the Aboriginal people and I really hadn't known anything about indigenous before that. And the more that I came to learn about who indigenous people were, what they meant to all of us, how they were holding the world together with their knowledge and all that they had to share with us, it was shameful to me what was being done to the Aborigines. And it was shameful to me, not what had been done, but what was still being done to them. And I thought to myself, I could say something to the world, but nobody would care because I'm, I'm nobody. But if I could get somebody who was somebody, if I could get a great writer to come and see who the Aboriginal people really were, and then to speak to the world and somehow bring the situation of the indigenous to the attention of the world, then that would be very meaningful. So I wrote to Gary Snyder. Uh, this was 1978. And I said, Gary, you don't know who I am, but I'm in a position to set you up a really nice tour with Aboriginal people and all kinds of Aboriginal poets and authors and songmen. And would you come? And he wrote me back a wonderful letter. Yes, let's go ahead and make that happen. So from 1978 until 1981, when we actually carried out the, the tour, um, I traversed about through Australia, talking with Aborigines, talking with different leaders and with literature boards and the Aboriginal Arts Board. And I learned lots of things. Only recently did I find out that the groundwork for our tour was actually laid some years before, because in 1972, Allen Ginsberg had gone over to Australia as part of the Adelaide Arts Festival, and he had met some Pitanjara songmen. And he loved chanting with them, and he chanted Hare Krishna, Hare Hare to them, and he was dazzled to find that when he started the second time through, they had already learned the chant and they were chanting with them. And he realized these guys, once you introduce it into sound, they get it, they catch it, they memorize it, they can mimic it. And so he wanted more. 
he ended up going to uh, the Northern Territories where he met a very well-known, beautiful artist whose name was Wanjuk Marika. And Wanjuk was a songman and he was engaged in singing and he and Alan became good friends. And Wanjuk went on to become one of the co-founders of what was called the Aboriginal Arts Board. So come 1979, when I approached the Arts Board and various literature boards uh, to bring Gary Snyder, to bring uh, poets and writers from the world, um, the, uh, the notion was not strange to them and they backed the idea. So the tour began to come together. And in 1981, I went back to the United States to meet the Iroquois Confederacy, who I had been um, using in my work with my students at the college, and to uh, actually join Tom Brown in his school and learn about tracking, as I had been learning tracking from the Aboriginal students. And Gary Snyder wrote me and he said, okay, you're gonna pick up Nanao and bring him to my house before we do this tour. So here came my first meeting with Nanao. And I uh, was driving with some friends and we were told to go to Taos and to pick Nanao up, which we did at the Lama Foundation. And we met lots of people in Nanao's circle, including Carol Merrill and uh, the little boy, Isa and John Brandy and various other uh, people, we came to realize that Nanao had this incredible family of, of, of young people who he fed all over the world with his poetry and his, with his essence, with his being. And so as we traveled, we went through Hopi land, through the Grand Canyon, down to Death Valley, and then we climbed up into the Sierra Nevada and as we got closer and closer to Gary's house, we played more and more music and we just came to really appreciate each other. So we got to Gary's house and Nanao stopped there with Gary. And I went ahead to, to Australia to prepare uh, for this six week tour. We called the tour Poems of Land and Life. And we got a really nice image from a, an artist named um, Jesse Allen and we put together a flyer and we put together lots of readings in Sydney and uh, Gary and Nanao arrived. The first night we went up on a roof at Bondi Beach and we looked out over Sydney and there were just lights and lights and millions of people. <laughs> and Nanao looked at me and he said, what are all these people doing here? <laughs> and we all cracked up. It was the kind of question that he would ask you that was so disarming and, and so comical. And from there we flew to uh, Adelaide, which was my kind of uh, central spot. We went to the college. Gary and Nanao did readings for the Aborigines. And all the time, what they were doing was they were talking to the Aborigines about the importance of their culture the importance of Aborigines practicing their culture and sharing it with the world, how important it was, the knowledge of indigenous people, the power of art, the power of culture, the power of song and music. And so we traveled about, and now it was time to go up into the outback. Now at that time, 1981, the main uh, thrust of land rights was Pichanchara land rights. And the Pichanchara were centered in the state of South Australia. There are different land councils for all the different parts, parts of Australia. And of course, we had to go through those land councils to get permission to go onto these tribal lands, to go to these various sites with the elders. And so we went and we, we gained permission to go up to what was called the outstations. Years ago, they had taken the Aborigines and they had rounded them up from their wanderings as free people. 
and they had put them onto these mission stations, uh, like what we would call reservations here in the United States. And so there would be like a major um, uh, settlement such as Ernabella, but from that place, certain people had decided to go back to the land. And this was called the outstation movement. And to go to the outstations, they would be closer to the sites that they needed to maintain, closer to the lifestyle that they chose to live, to get away from the, the sugar and the flour and the tea, get back to the bush tucker, and to actually care for themselves and care for the land. So we went and we visited uh, a place called Amarda. We went to a place called Frigon. And, and Gary and Nanao got to really, really experience um, Aboriginal people in uh, self-governance and what they could do when they were taking care of their own affairs. It was beautiful to watch Nanao study the earth because he's so fascinated with everything. He just likes to walk. And as he walks, he studies everything from the names of all the birds and all the plants and all the rocks. He, he would learn the names of all the stars and the different winds. And, and from that, of course, came all his beautiful poetry. So one of his first poems that he wrote was uh, in, in the book Break the Mirror. It's called October 81. And it kind of describes the feeling that he had as he watched the, the wedgetail eagles soaring over that big, beautiful rock. And it's incredible, the silence, the deep, deep silence that you can hear and feel when you're in the outback of Australia. So this, this um, really moved Gary and Nanao. And we had the time now to go to Uluru and we got to walk around Uluru because at the time uh, the National Park was caring for the rock and you could go all over it. You could climb up and over it and you could go in all the caves around the base. And uh, there were lots of secret sites and secret places that the Aborigines wanted to close off for their own use because they were so sacred and so secret and so within this walk in the line with the aboriginal people and 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 trying to get the land rights for them uh, we made our way around uluru now now touched uluru at one point going into one of the caves and it was so smooth to his hand it was the touch of like something we would touch when we go to the Vatican and we climb the steps of the Vatican and we find that it's been polished by the knees of, of, of millions of pilgrims. And when Nanao felt that on Uluru and he realized the depth of what he was seeing and experiencing, it was a tremendous thing. And that's when he wrote that beautiful poem, Chant of a Rock. As he says in the poem, 40,000 years I've been waiting for you and now you come back to me. And, and so he was moved, he was touched, and he loved um, you know, to write in longhand. And because I was with him and on the tour and he would bring those poems to breakfast and we would go over them and I would see them in their, in their roughest, roughest form and, um, and sometimes he'd ask me um, for words or what did I think of this image or uh, it, was, it was super fun. Now Gary um, and Nanao, they were uh, on every single place we went that was a university, that was a bookstore, uh, that had anything to do with uh, literature because we were answering to the literature boards that had um, given us money to come over, uh, whether on a state level or a national level. And so we were kind of working um, all the different levels, the academic level, the grassroots level, the naturalist uh, level, studying everything that we could 
from here, there, and everywhere. And so one day, uh, this was all pretty tiring to Gary and Nanawa. And so they, they begged me for a day off. And I granted them permission because um, I couldn't uh, keep pushing them. So they went and uh, lay down in their room in Toddy's cabin in Alice Springs. And a friend of mine decided to take me um, on a hunt. And we went out and we, we got some, some tucker, we got some rabbits. And uh, one of the things we brought back was a, was a, a lizard. And the lizard had been cooked in the ground. Uh, its insides had been taken out and it had been um, charred and blackened in the fire and cooked in the dirt. And so when we lifted it up out of the hole, it was still a uh, hole, like a, a big stuffed animal. And so I came into the room at Toddy's cabin and I made some noise and I wiggled the lizard in. <laughs> Nana was on the top bunk and he had his reading glasses on and he kind of he kind of jumped down and I broke off a piece of the lizard and I handed it to him and told him to try it and he took a bite of it and he chewed on it and he looked at me and he said oh a dinosaur but a no soy sauce and we um, we cracked up the next day uh, we had a lovely, lovely time eating that with our Aboriginal friends. And uh, from there, we traveled around Alice Springs. We went to the Institute of uh, Aboriginal Development and gave a talk uh, on culture and the importance of Aboriginal languages. Uh, we went to a, a, a media station with a guy named John Macumba, uh, Kama it was called. We did a radio interview there, and we traveled around to different um, groups who worked with what they called uh, fringe dwellers, people who had come in from the bush. Uh, they weren't really living in a settlement, uh, and they were just living on the edge of town, sometimes sleeping in the uh, creek beds and that around town, and they had their own um, la land council. I think the name was Tanganjira. So we went all uptown and downtown and really enjoyed. And now it was time for a big uh, poetry reading. Now, this was a place called Araluen. And uh, I had been told by a friend of mine, a poet named Richard Tipping, that uh, there was a, an American guy named Billy Marshall Stone King. And he and some other poets were working with the songmen of the Pintubi uh, tribe. And this was at another uh, settlement called Papanya. And we had been invited to come to that settlement. So those three songmen, Jimmy and Tutuma and Nosepeg, were going to do a reading with Gary and Nanao for the people of Alice Springs. Well, it all was pretty cool. And we heard at that time that Allen Ginsberg had been there ahead of us and had done some readings with Aboriginal songmen. As I said, the idea of a songman, of somebody who holds the tribal knowledge, and not only that, but who sings it, who remembers it, and who sings it, and who practices it, and sings it with others. And it was around that time that a man named Bruce Chapman had written a book that was called Song Lines. And suddenly this idea that Aborigine people were singing their way through the landscape, that there were actually, that the continent of Australia was like this great symphony of songs, which were held together by the stories the dreamings of the various ancestral beings who had made the earth. Imagine that there were people who knew that and remembered that and practiced that and maintained that, and that there was an energy grid for our earth that was maintained 
by indigenous people and their ceremonies. This was a, a huge thought. And so we were actually engaged um, with the songmen in the story. That night they decided to take us on a, on a long walk because they chanted and chanted and chanted and chanted. And Billy finally ha had them stop and he laughed to the audience and he said, well, that story actually goes from Alice Springs to Darwin, but we only got about an hour up the trail. And now it was time for Gary and Nanao to read their poetry, and they did. And it was really, really well received. The next day, we got into a truck to drive to Papanya. And as we were driving, one of the elders was singing and singing and singing and singing, and he wouldn't stop. He just kept singing and singing and singing. And Gary asked what was going on. And it was explained to him that that old fella, Jimmy, his job was to sing the song of that route that we were taking to his homeland. And he couldn't let it be unsung, but it was normally done at a walking pace. But for the purposes of this trip, he had to sing it at 40 miles an hour and make sure that he didn't forget any of the pieces because that's what makes the song have power. There were places along the trail, along the road, where we would stop. And in one, just as an example, one of the old men got us out and we started walking just into the desert, not knowing quite where we were going, but following, and, and his voice got softer and softer until finally he motioned to us that we needed to get down on our hands and knees. And we did, and we got down on our hands and knees, and we crawled, and we crawled, and now he had us get down even lower, more into an actual a crawl along the ground. And he led us under a, a rock, that was tipped over and we slid under it and rolled over to look up at all these beautiful paintings that had been painted there. And as you go in the heat of the day and you lie there and you study the paintings, you realize this is the most intelligent thing that you could be doing on such a hot day in the middle of the desert would be under this rock, um, learning, studying, expressing, maintaining. And this is the practice of, of the Aboriginal life. This is a, a part of it, of the, of the central desert. And then it was time to leave the rock and we came back out and we did the whole process in reverse, coming back up to our knees walking along so, so quietly, and then finally standing up, and then finally speaking again in our normal um, voice. So we traveled to Papanya, and for another vignette of Nanao, he, uh, of course, had his hair pulled back in his, in his uh, samurai style, and we went to the school to visit the children and he grabbed a broom from the corner and he picked it up as a samurai sword and he chased all the little Aboriginal kids around the room, um, giving his best samurai yells. So he was really uh, uh, generous with his antics. When we did readings with the elders, Nanao was enjoying chanting um, Ainu chants which he knew from the Ainu people of um, Hokkaido. He was very uh, knowledgeable about them. He had a, a kind of a, a vast library of chants that he liked to uh, do. And he spoke about them as the, the bear people and the Aborigines were very fascinated, not only by the sound of the songs, but by the stories that they now told about the, the, uh, the Ainu people. We visited more sacred sites around the Papanya area. Sometimes they were strange shaped rocks. 
Sometimes they were paintings on the walls of a, of a, uh, a pass going, you know, along a waterway. Um, the whole landscape in Australia is animated and, and, and known and studied and loved. And to be with people who knew that and who maintained it and cared for it was really such an honor. Now, Nanao would look at me now and again, and he would say, we need to protect these people. They are our teachers. We need to listen to them. They are our teachers. Because it was already known at that time that the multinational mining corporations were digging up the sacred sites in Australia and that the sacred sites, the sacred to the Aborigines, could also be a mine or a source of bauxite or a source of gold or a source of copper. And so the, whether it was Rio Tinto zinc or some other major multinational, um, they were coming in with money from all the different countries. It wasn't just Australia that was digging them up. It wasn't just America. It wasn't just England, but uh, Japanese interests also. And Nanao spoke about how he was going to let his young army of Japanese um, hippie uh, people know about what was going on in Australia because he really wasn't certain that everyone was aware of this. So I think one of the things that really impressed Nanao about this whole tour was how many levels uh, we were able to work on um, with the, na the natural level and with the cultural level and with the political level and the person-to-person -person level. And I think Nanao enjoyed all the levels because he was very much into saving Earth saving life on earth and i think if you read his poems that's what you what, what comes through so as our time at uh, papanya came to a close it was time to hop back into that ute as they call them utility ve vehicle and travel back to alice springs but before we left we had a kangaroo and we we cooked it in the ground Watching Nose Peg, um, you know, break, break the legs and, and prep the insides and how they cook it in the ground to get the most vitality from it. And then as we lay there, there was singing going on and the stars were brilliant, you know. They say stars so bright, you know, that they, they, they make noise. And the sound of the song sticks and the taste of the kangaroo and... It was really such a, a, a remarkable experience. And we got in the truck and we got back to Alice Springs and that night we caught a plane and we flew right to Canberra, right into the, the thick of the civilization and we went to a, a literature party where everybody had on coats and ties and it was really uh, jarring. It was so jarring to go from the one world to the other in a day. And then now came to me and he had a, a look on his face and he said, to confusion, to confusion. The next morning, he knocked on my door and he burst into my room and he had written a poem and it really pleased him what he had written. And... Uh, and it was called Break the Mirror. And he read it to me, and I'm not going to read all of his poems that he wrote there in Australia, but this one, I really think that I will. Break the Mirror. In the morning, after taking cold shower, what a mistake, I look into the mirror. There, a funny guy gray hair, white beard, wrinkled skin. What a pity. Poor, dirty, old man. 
He is not me. Absolutely not. Land and life. Fishing in the ocean. Sleeping in the desert with stars. Building a shelter in the mountain. Farming in the ancient way. Singing with coyote. Singing against nuclear war. I'll never be tired of life. Now I'm 17 years old. A very charming young man. I sit down quietly in the lotus position. Meditating. Meditating. Meditating for nothing. Suddenly a voice comes to me. To stay young. To save the world. Break the mirror. I understood how that break can happen. How, how different the worlds are that we live in. And you know, one of the things I learned from Gary Snyder was not to run people down for what they had done to the earth or what nightmare we had uh, put upon each other in what we call human history, but that we should take the time to praise the people who didn't behave like that, that we should accentuate the positive and that we should find people like the Indian people, American Indians, and like the Aborigines and like the other indigenous people in the world who did not engage in that kind of behavior and that we should praise them and we should thank them because they were providing us um, with models of a different way to behave. So we traveled on in the circles of the literate, the literate people and we traveled uh, to Melbourne and we went to Sydney. And there in Sydney, there was a, a premiere of a movie. And there was some young guys who I knew, some musicians from Adelaide. Um, one band, uh, young Aborigines, was called uh, uh, Us Mob. And the other was called No Fixed Address. And the two of them were premiering a new movie, which was called The Wrong Side of the Road. So we went to the premiere, and Gary and Nanao read their poetry. We, we went to the, um, uh, golly, I think we, we performed at the Symphony House, too, because everywhere we went, you know, they were known as these famous poets from, from the United States. So that pretty much concluded our tour, and yet there was still some time to go because Gary had a friend whose name was Les Blakeborough who lived in Tasmania. And we uh, tacked on another week or so in Tasmania. Now Tasmania is cut off from the mainland of Australia and it has some very, very interesting um, animals there. Of course, there's the, the platypus. And the platypus became uh, uh, an image for Nanao uh, this crazy thing with the bill of a duck and the, and the fur of an animal and, and, and just kind of lives in a burrow uh, and looks like it was sewn together by a, by a scientist. And so he took that as an image of Australia. And his poem, Platypus, was, Come on, Australia, come on out of your burrow. Let me see who you are. Let me, let me see what you can do. They did a an interview with some people for the media there in Hobart, Tasmania, and one of the interviewers asked uh, Nanao if he was looking for the thylacine. He was looking for the Tasmanian tiger. And in true Nanao fashion, he said, no, I, I think he's looking for me. Yeah. And so we, we stayed on for another little while. And Nanao had one more thing that he really wanted to do, and that was to see the fairy penguins come ashore. Gary needed to get back to the United States, so we put him on an airplane and 
uh, Nanao and I found a place where we could go, and we went at at uh, dusk, and we lay down on the um, bank, looking down to the ocean above one of the penguin rookeries, not quite sure what it was that we were going to experience. And we kept watching and we kept watching and we kept watching and it got darker and darker and darker until you could barely, barely see a figure. And right at that moment, out of the ocean, came a little fella, just, just a few inches, you know, eight, ten inches tall, just one little fairy penguin. And he came up onto the beach and he looked this way and he looked that way and he gave a call and out of the ocean came thousands and thousands of fairy penguins. And we watched them as they came up and crawled up into the rookery and crawled past us. And it was a most remarkable, remarkable um, thing to experience. And that little penguin he became Little Captain Cook, another one of Nanao's poetry. So when you put it together and you see that October uh, 81 and the chant of the rock and the platypus, uh, the, the um, break the mirror, uh, Little Captain Cook, it was a tremendously uh, creative time for Nanao. Uh, he loved every single piece of it. And he continued to talk about it for years and years after. Now, Gary had made the promise to the literature board that we would write something of consequence for the world. And he put together a most wonderful uh, essay, which is called Good, Wild, and Sacred, which you can find in the practice of the wild, where he talks about the different gradations of of the earth and how different tribal peoples utilize those types of land. Um, but of course, the one that we've lost is the sacred, the sacredness of land, the sacredness of a sacred site, a place where there's water no matter how deep the drought that no one would camp near that because you would never want to endanger the water source for the people. These kinds of ideas are just so important. Um, and it all came about from our time with the Aboriginal people back then in 1981. Now you remember that I told you uh, that it all started with a dream and that dream was so simple walking around Uluru with Gary Snyder and another person whose face I couldn't see. As we were walking around Uluru the day that Nana was experiencing the smoothness of the cave on his hand, we walked right into that dream. I stopped and I looked at Gary and I said, Gary, did you ever wonder why I wrote you that first letter to come here? And he said, well, yes, John, I did. I did wonder about that. And I said, that was because I dreamt this moment. And the person that I couldn't see was Nanao because it wasn't Nanao yet. There were other people who were trying to come. And so Gary said, well, then we should take a photo here which we did, and you can see that now here in our little movie. So I'm very happy to share these stories with you. I hope that it opens up some of the, uh, some of the magic and some of the beauty and some of the creative process that, that Gary and, and Nanao go through. And we certainly had a wonderful time, all of us together. And we did fulfill our promise to the Aboriginal people. And I'd like to think that all the things, all the positive things that we learned and that we shared with the world are still there uh, for everyone to 
see and feel and know. The Indigenous people are so important. The Aboriginal people of Australia are so important. It's vital that we learn from them. As Nanao said, they are our teachers. So Nanao, wherever you are cruising this universe, happy birthday. Uh, I hope it's fun to be 100 years old. Thank you. So I'd like to thank uh, Gary Lawless for this opportunity for including me and allowing me to to join in this grand global event and also to uh, Felipe in Brazil who came up with the idea of such a of such a thing to Carol Merrill who's been a, a friend uh, for a long time to Isa uh, her son to all the poets in Australia who helped me set up this tour, especially Richard Tipping, Billy Marshall, and all the guys along the way, to all the Aboriginal poets that we met and that we read with, to all the elders who allowed us to come with them and be with them and were so generous with their, their words and their songs and their actions, and to um, everybody who's joining in this great effort, let's, let's really honor Nanao. Let's honor what he believed in and let's send out a big, a big push to all the young people of the world to let them know that there are people who care. Thank you. Mm -hmm.